It is now time for all questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier, Speaker. Uh, all week, the Premier has been laying the groundwork for cuts to our schools, our hospitals, and the services that families rely on. And This week, we heard from the Premier's Bay Street consultants. They were supposed to produce a line-by-line -line audit, and instead, they produced a laundry list of schemes that will work wonders for the Premier's wealthy friends, but leave families falling behind. Does the Premier support this plan for deep cuts, new fees for families, and a fire sale of public assets? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Leader of the Opposition, what we support is putting money back into the taxpayer's pocket, reducing taxes, reducing hydro bills, reducing the gas price by 10 cents a litre, and we're halfway there. We're about respecting the taxpayers. We aren't about taking care of the backroom deals and all the insiders and all the lobbyists that the Leader of the Opposition is uh, working with. Yep. We're for the people, we're for the little guy, and we're going to continue being for the frontline workers and everyone in Ontario. It's about for the people. Yeah. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it looks like the Premier's Bay Street consultants came up with the real Tory platform. Unfortunately, people didn't get to see it until after the campaign. Page 38 proposes new user fees, new user fees on services that families rely on. Page 41 calls for reduced tax credits to businesses, like, for example, the film and television tax credit. And page 43 proposes a sell-off of the OLG, LCBO, and Ontario Power Generation for a one-time cash payout. It's a platform that will make the Premier's Bay Street buddies very happy, but it will leave families and businesses paying higher fees, hydro, higher hydro rates, and cuts to their schools and hospitals. Is the Premier going to reject these ideas today, or is he ready to admit that this was the real Tory platform all along? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind the Leader of the Opposition we actually froze the fees, the license registration fees that you approved, that, that the Leader of the Opposition approved, the Minister of Transportation actually froze them. Here, here. So we aren't here increasing the them. But the Leader of the Opposition actually voted to increase it. We're going to make sure that we freeze all user fees and make sure that we put money back into the taxpayer's pocket once again. Final supplementary. Not true. Basically not true. People, Speaker, I believe that the Premier is, uh, is out order. of order in his accusations, and I take them very personally. He hasn't been here. He knows very well the New Democrats never supported a Liberal budget in their majority government, and that's, uh, that's the reality. So I don't appreciate uh, his untruth, Speaker. People were hoping for help with— I have to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. I'll withdraw, Speaker, but you should pay attention to what the Premier is saying. You have to withdraw without qualification. I did. People were hoping for help with their schools, investment in their hospitals, and a plan to create jobs from this government. Those are the priorities they were hoping that the government would look at. But they're quickly learning that Doug Ford's, in Doug Ford's Ontario, change means a heck of a lot more of the same. Insiders get rich off fire sales of public assets, the wealthy get another round of tax cuts, and families get higher fees, higher hydro rates, and funding cuts to their schools and hospitals. If this is the change that the Premier was planning, why didn't he say so during the campaign, Speaker? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition propped up the Liberal budgets, the minority budgets, supported every single tax increase they put in, made sure they stood shoulder to shoulder, propping up the, the Liberals to a tune of 97%. The Leader of the Opposition is responsible for the financial disaster this province is facing today.
Next question. The question is also for the Premier Speaker, but you know, ignorance is no excuse for a misinformed Premier. Speaking of uh, backroom meetings, uh, uh, Speaker, can the Premier tell us uh, who, is being, uh, who he's been meeting with concerning his plans to cut the minimum wage and take away vacation days for single moms, sick time for parents, and fair wages for temporary workers? <laughs> through, through you, Mr. Speaker, again to the Leader of the Opposition, we need to turn this province around. Here, here. We need to create jobs. There was 300,000 manufacturing jobs that were lost because of the Leader of the Opposition yep. supporting the Liberal yep. government. Every step of the way. Supported the carbon tax, the Green Energy Act. They're destroying this province, destroying jobs. Endless companies are heading south of the border because it's more feasible to do business down there. We're going to make sure we attract new businesses, attract new jobs by getting rid of the carbon tax, Green Energy Act, lowering gas prices, lowering electricity costs. That's what we're going to do. We're going to start employing people. We're going to make sure Ontario thrives as a province. Here, here, here. For the you know, Speaker, I think it's important that the Premier knows that his uh, party supported the Liberals 49 per cent of the time, oh. and, we, and we supported them 53 per cent oh, of the sorry, time. Sorry. Four per cent difference. So, in fact, his rhetoric oh. is something that he has oh. to. Uh, admit to himself, Speaker. Uh, today's news reports, though, that lobbyists are frantically working the back rooms trying to cancel the scheduled increases to the minimum wage and to take away the new sick days and pay equity protections granted to Ontario workers this year. The Premier talks about standing up for the little guy, Speaker, but the working moms who need a raise and a sick day don't have lobbyists in his back rooms to try to get him to do the right thing. Why is the Premier ignoring the those moms, Speaker. Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, again, 97 per cent of the time. I know it's tough for the Leader of the Opposition yep. to do the math. Drop the Dur up. During the election, they were $5 billion off on their budget. I can assure you, every business I talk to, no matter if it's small, medium, or large, they're struggling right now. Yep. They're struggling with Bill 148. Tens of thousands of people lost their jobs when it came to Bill 148. Yep. We will make sure Ontario is competitive. Yep. We'll make sure we attract businesses from all over the world to open up here in Ontario and attract good paying jobs. I have to remind the Leader of the Opposition, if it was up to the Leader of the Opposition, there'd be 7,500 yep. people unemployed right now out at the Pickering nuclear facility. Yep, they were the Leader of the spots. Opposition didn't worry about that. They worry about lining the pockets of their buddies, making back. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the priorities of this government are becoming more and more clear. The Premier is hearing from his Bay Street consultants and lobbyists, and he is delivering for them. But the working mom earning a minimum wage won't be getting the sick day she needs or the pay raise she deserves uh, or the pay raise that she needs. And instead of a hand up, she's going to get hit with new service fees and hydro bills from a privatized electricity company. It doesn't have to be this way, though, Speaker. Will the Premier move ahead with the increase in minimum wage? And and commit to maintaining job benefits like sick days. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Leader of the Opposition, the single mom lost her job under the Liberals and the NDP regime. The single mom wants a job to make sure that she can put food on the table. The Leader of the Opposition supported the outrageous hydro rates that were the highest in North America. I had people come up to me, single moms, all day, all night when I was campaigning saying, I can't afford my hydro bill. I have a choice between heating and eating. But that was all right for the Leader of the Opposition. As long as she makes sure she takes care of her buddies, the special activists, the backroom deals, we know what it's all about. You know, the party's over with the taxpayers' money. It's about time we respect the taxpayers and start creating good paying jobs. Start the clock. 
Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, well, thanks, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier, and I have to say again, ignorance is no excuse for an uh, uh, uninformed Premier who doesn't know what happened here over the years that he was nowhere to be found. Uh, but yesterday, after four days— Again, I, I have to remind all members that the personal insults do not elevate the debate, and, and we have to try to keep our questions focused on, on government policy, but ask all members to keep that in mind. I recognize, again, the Leader of the Opposition to put her question. After four days of refusing to do so, the Premier tweeted a denunciation of hate speech. Will he now say out loud and unequivocally that he does not support Faith Goldie's campaign for mayor? Oh, boy. Premier. Well, to you, to you, Mr. Speaker, I've been clear over and over and over again every single day. I condemn hate speech, anti-Semitism, racism from all forms, be it from Faith Goldie, be it from anyone. But let's talk about the hypocrisy. Let's talk. Premier will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Withdraw. Next question. For people, in Ontario, for people in Ontario concerned about the rise of organized hate, this week has been very, very concerning. The government was already cutting support to programs like the anti-racism secretariat, but then they watched this week as the Premier refused for again and again York to Center, distance to himself order from a candidate for Toronto mayor who promotes a white nationalist agenda and makes common cause with neo-Nazis. Will this Premier say now, out loud and unequivocally, that he does not support her campaign? That was a supplementary question. Premier, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, again, I find this so ironic. You have members there from Ottawa Centre passionately supports the radical and extreme boycott the divestment and sanctions, known better as BDS, movement against Israel. I want you to denounce your own members. You have another member from Brampton East that police demonstrated with F the police sign. Another member from Toronto St. Paul used racial slurs against our police chief. I'll tell you, the Centre of Israeli and Jewish Affairs has described one of your members as anti-Semitism disguised as anti-Zionist. I would like to know if the Leader of the Opposition is willing to denounce your own members. You had another member. Once again, the personal insults and attacks do not elevate the debate. It diminishes the debate. And anybody watching would be, would be most unimpressed. I'd ask all members to remember that. Next question. Start the clock. Member for King Bond. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities, Speaker, this Parliament should be seized with the success of our young people. There should be unity of purpose in this Legislature, focused on the enablement of our young people to learn, to develop and to compete and succeed. For students, the metric of success is not only the attainment of knowledge in the classroom, but the application of that knowledge into the workforce. Progressive Conservatives on this side of the House are determined to give our students in this province every tool to achieve, because this government is resolutely focused on enabling the next generation to pursue their full God-given potential. Speaker, later today I will join the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities at Seneca College in my riding of King Vaughan for the official opening of Magna Hall. Minister, through you, Speaker, can the Minister outline why this investment in our colleges uh, will support our students, strengthen our, our knowledge economy, and give our young people the, the tools to get a good-paying job? Yeah. Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. 
and thank you to the member opposite for the question and the strong advocacy for the people of King Vaughan and the young people of this province. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, as the member said, our government is focused on creating jobs and opportunity for our young people. And I want all the people of Ontario to reach their full potential. And that is why I'm so excited that later today I will join the member from King Vaughan, Seneca College President David Agnew, and others to officially open Magna Hall. And the new Magna Hall, sitting at 200,000 square feet, is home to a new library, over 25 classrooms, and computer and healthcare labs, providing hands on learning for Seneca students. Magna Hall is providing the education, training, and support that students need for the workforce of tomorrow here, here. to bring well paid jobs back to Ontario, grow our communities, and make Ontario open for business again. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Minister, on behalf of students across the province, I say thank you for investing in their success, not indebting them to failure. Mr. Mr. Speaker, young people in my riding of King Vaughan and across the province remain concerned about the inheritance as a generation, as they inherit a legacy of liberal debt, of spending more on interest on debt than on funding of colleges and universities in this province. The next generation asks one thing of this generation, that we never mortgage their future. And let me assure the young people in this province, we we hear you, we are with you, and we will fight to protect your futures every single day. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, youth employment remains stubbornly high, effectively twice the provincial average. Young people cannot find good-paying jobs. The skills mismatch in our economy impedes our students' ability to find employment related to their skills. Question. This undermines our economic competitiveness. Speaker, through the minister, could she outline how our investment in Seneca College will provide the next generation with job skills they need to attain good-paying jobs? Minister. As I said before, my focus is on making sure that Ontario students reach their full potential. Our government has promised the people of Ontario to create good jobs so our young people can find high-quality employment. And I want to make sure that our young people have the skills they need to fill those jobs and build a career for themselves in their communities. And while the previous Liberal government accumulated massive debt loads, which we will be a burden on future generations, our government is listening to the people of Ontario, to the business community and post-secondary institutions to ensure that our young people can find a good job in Ontario and have a good future. Speaker, I congratulate Seneca College on the opening of Magna Hall and its focus on real-world, hands-on learning Bonds. for students. I look forward to tour touring the facility later today and continuing to work with Seneca and all our institutions to ensure that Ontario is home to the best education system and workforce in the world. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Before I get into my question, I have to say two words on behalf of the Jewish community where I'm from, given what the Premier just said. Oi, Gewalt. Goodness gracious. People here stand up against hate, Premier. I, we really reject your slurs. I also have to say my question, Speaker, is for the Deputy Premier. Earlier this week, the government released a report outlining privatization and outsourcing. Meanwhile, the wet law for inquiry is taking place, and they say we should be focused on public delivery. Every dollar that goes into goes into private care is a dollar taken away uh, from public care. Will the Deputy Premier expand the mandate of the wet law for inquiry to include quality care and funding models so we can ensure Ontario seniors and their families have access to the highest quality of long-term care? Deputy Premier. Well, the terms of reference for the wet law for inquiry were set long ago, and in fact, they're almost finished hearing evidence, and they're continuing to do their work, preparing their report and recommendations, and we're awaiting those recommendations, which we take very seriously. The safety of our seniors is a primary concern for us, and we are going to wait for the wet law for inquiry to finish and see what the recommendations are, and we will take them into uh, consideration and take that report very seriously. So thank you for that. Supplementary. Thank, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Deputy Premier, for that answer. But we know that people deserve dignity as they age. And despite the fact that the WEF law for inquiry is coming to an end, we need to ramp up on that model. 
What we need to make sure is that public dollars go towards frontline care and staffing. It shouldn't disappear into private profit margins. The wet law for inquiry is her testimony that says, quote, all roads lead to problems with staffing and funding. Given the testimony to the wet law for inquiry, will the Deputy Premier agree to expand the inquiry's mandate after its completion to ensure it looks at the impacts of privatization and long-term care across our province? Deputy Premier. Well, what I certainly can tell the member is that we are working on those issues every day at the Ministry of Health. One of our primary mandates and what we ran for on June 7th was to expand long-term care, to create 15,000 new beds in five years and another 15,000 in 10 years. We take that seriously. We are working on that every day to try and build up that capacity because we do know that there are over 30,000 people that are waiting for spaces, and that's causing problems in our hospitals. It's causing problems in our communities. We are working on that. But you are right. We need to take a look at human resources. We do know that there's a shortage of personal support workers, for example, many of whom work in long-term care. We are looking at understanding why, although people are graduating, they're not continuing to work in the sector. There's lots of reasons for that, and we're looking to correct that so that when we have those beds ready, they will be able to operate with qualified health care professionals to take care of the people who've worked hard all their lives and who deserve to be treated in comfort and dignity. Thank you. Next question, the member for Flamborough, Glendale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Yesterday, it was announced that the WSIB had eliminated its unfunded liability, which in 2011 was as high as $14 billion. Wow. It was also announced that the higher-than-average premium rates paid by Ontario employers will be reduced by an average of 30 per cent beginning in January of 2019. All in all, it was great news for Ontario. Since yesterday, I have heard from businesses and workers in my riding of Flamborough-Glanbrook who are interested in what this could mean for them. Can the minister explain why the elimination of the WSIB's unfunded liability was so important for the sustainability of the WSIB and why a rate reduction for employers is great news for all of Ontario. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for uh, the great question and for her work representing her constituents. Uh, I'm honoured to rise in the House to speak about yesterday's announcement. Our government has long advocated that an unfunded liability was unacceptable. The elimination of the WSIB's unfunded liability means that the WSIB has enough money set aside to provide the benefits that injured workers are entitled to. It also means that workers can now have the confidence that if they are hurt on the job or develop illnesses related to their work, that they will receive the benefits to which they are entitled. We will continue working with the WSIB to serve workers well, whether it's return to work, or recovery outcomes, or customer service. Our government will also work with the board to ensure a modern, financially and sustainable accountability workplace Response. safety and insurance system now and for generations to come. Mr. Speaker, it was a great announcement yesterday for workers well, well, well. and for businesses. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the minister, clearly both employers and workers will benefit from yesterday's annou Agreed. announcement. Now, I've heard from many businesses, again in my riding of Flamborough-Glanbrook, about the excessively high premium rates that they've been paying for many years. It seems to me that these high rates have hindered Ontario businesses. Local businesses across Ontario, like bakeries, mom-and-pop shops, diners, need to have the resources to invest back into their businesses, to attract investment, and to have a strong, confident workforce that is assured that if the unthinkable happens, to benefits to which they are entitled are there for them. Can the minister please explain to this House how businesses and workers will benefit from this announcement? Great. Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again to the member for the question. Um, it's true, Mr. Speaker. Businesses across Ontario have been paying higher premium rates than other provinces for many years. This was a definite barrier for businesses to grow and expand. 
So, with the elimination of the unfunded liability, Mr. Speaker, the premium rate reduction for businesses across the province means that employers will be able to keep more of the money that they've earned to invest right back into their operations and to help grow their businesses and create jobs for the people of Ontario, resulting in a $1.45 billion injection into the Ontario economy. That is good news for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, tucked into the Erst and Young report, amongst sweeping recommendations to sell off public assets like the LCBO, there's one line that should give all parents pause. It calls for alternate arrangements, quote unquote, for funding education, including, and I quote, providing funding to individuals who can then choose their service providers through a form of market activity. Will the minister tell us now if she plans to bring American style vouchers and charter schools to Ontario? Is the minister really planning to funnel public dollars to private education? Minister of Education. They have a creative imagination over there. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, to the member opposite through you, I would like to share that what we're doing right now is absolutely focusing on preparing our students for the best path forward to be equipped for 21st century jobs. You know, the fear-mongering and the propaganda that comes from that side of the House, from that opposition party, is just non-stop. And I want to assure people that as we embark on our consultation, we are going to be working on a path forward with educators, with parents, with students, with interested organizations that want to make a difference and that are wanting to work with us. Just yesterday, I met with the Public, Tr Public School Board Trustees Association, and they reported publicly that we had a fantastic meeting. And honestly, Spons. Speaker, we are moving forward in a positive manner, setting all the fear mongering aside. Here, here. Thank you very much. Very good. Mr. Speaker, uh, it's right there in the report. Exactly. It's right there in the report. And though it is just 48 pages long, the government's $95,000 commissioned report calls for radical changes that would devastate Ontario's public education system. Public. This approach in the United States has decimated, decimated public education. You only have to look to the South to see that. I'm actually really surprised, Mr. Speaker, that the Minister of Education wouldn't just end this conversation by saying, no, we're not thinking about privatizing education. We're not thinking about charter programs. We're not thinking about vouchers. But you won't say that. The Minister of Education will not say that. Why? Will the minister stand up for Ontario families and reject the privatization of education now? Will she do that now? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell the member opposite what I reject. I reject the fallacies that they are trying to project into the conversation. And the fact of the matter is, that's not our report, and they need to stop the, the falsehoods that they're perpetuating. Just reject it. Ask the Minister of Education to withdraw the unparliamentary remark. I withdraw. Thank you. Next question. The minister, the the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my questions for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, this morning I spent time with my friend Bernie Farber, who's here with colleagues. They're here. They're concerned. They're calling on the Premier to disassociate himself with Faith Goldie, a known white supremacist. I know that the Speaker, Mr. Sure. Speaker, I know the Premier sent out a tweet last night denouncing hate speech, even if coming from Faith Goldie. Yes or no Mr. Question. Speaker, that is not enough. It's not enough for those people who are truly and frightened, frightened by seeing their Premier standing shoulder to shoulder with a white supremacist. Mr. Speaker, the Premier needs to say those words here. And I'm calling on the Premier today to be a true leader, to say those words, to say those words here in the People's House, to say, I denounce Faith Goldie and what she stands for. I do not stand shoulder to shoulder with her, and I do not support her campaign. And I apologize to those people who are frightened and deeply hurt. Thank you, Speaker. Listening, Premier. 
Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member of Etobicoke, uh, Etobicoke South, Ottawa South. Sorry to insult the people in Etobicoke, in <laughs> Ottawa South. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I would. It's, it's, it's not helpful, Premier. Yeah. Complete your answer, please. So, <laughs> Maybe the member from Ottawa South should talk to his friend from Ottawa Centre over there. Ottawa Centre that passionately supports the radical BDS movement against Israel. Maybe you should be talking to your friend in the far corner over there. But please make your comments through the chair and depersonalize them. Through you, through you Mr. Speaker, maybe the leader of the opposition to denounce one of our candidates Spons. in Scarborough Agent Court, Taslim Riaz, shared an inspir inspir inspirational quote from Adolf Hitler on our Facebook. The Premier will take a seat. <laughs> Supplementary. Th thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, Order. I thank the uh, people for his response. And Order. I Speak. Order. 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 I recognize the member for his supplementary. Over here, not over there. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that's not the response that I expected. That's not what a true leader does. My father taught me that when you've got some, done something wrong, when you've hurt someone, when you've made a mistake, that you need to apologize. And when you make that apology, you need to do it in front of the people that you've hurt. Two days ago, in this two days ago another leader in this legislature, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, said those words. He said those words out in the hall, and I know if I asked him today, he'd say those words right here. So, Premier, so Speaker, through you to the Premier, again, I call on the Premier to denounce Faith Goldie, to denounce what she stands for, to renounce her campaign, and to apologize to those people who are hurt and deeply concerned. Thank you. Premier. To, to you, Mr. Speaker, I would like the Leader of the Opposition to denounce one of her candidates, Tasleem Riaz, shared an inspirational quote from Adolf Hitler. From Adolf Hitler. The Leader of the Opposition stood side by side, campaigned with this candidate, took pictures with this candidate. I'd like the Leader to denounce the member from Scarborough. I'd also like the Leader of the Opposition to denounce the Ottawa Centre candidate. Yeah, sorry. I think all members know that you're not allowed to hold up props and signs. I would ask members on both sides of the House to stop putting up signs. Premier, if you will briefly conclude your comments. The member from Ottawa Centre sitting in the corner again supports the radical BDS. You can yes, the Premier's comments. Premier will come to order. The Premier will come to order. Order. Clock sticking. Order. The next question. Let's move on. Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Premier. The Premier will withdraw. You have to stand up and withdraw. Order. Come on. We can do better than this. 
Next question, member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. A month ago, our Government of the People announced a province-wide consultation with businesses across Ontario to reduce red tape. Fifteen years of failed Liberal policies have done serious damage to our competitiveness. Red tape is chasing job creators out of this province. In Ontario, the regulatory burden is getting worse every year, yet across the, the border in the United States, they're reducing it. And it's making it attractive for Ontario investment to leave this province. Could the minister give us an update on what he's heard and how our government will make Ontario more competitive? Uh, Minister Speaker, of Economic uh, Thank you, my honourable colleague, uh, for the question. Uh, business owners have described a toxic environment here in Ontario created by the former Liberal government and propped up by the NDP. In my own riding, Burger Bistro, a longtime fixture of downtown Alliston, shut down after the implementation of Bill 148. Skyrocketing costs left a number of people unemployed. Joe Lipschitz, Lip Lipschitz a uh, accountant and owner of Lake Simcoe Arms Pub and Restaurant, employs close to 60 people, expressed his frustration to me recently. He and his wife put everything on the line and, in their own words, were treated like pariahs by the former government. Speaker, hardworking people who risk money and put their livelihoods on the on the line to pursue their dreams should be rewarded, encouraged, not suffocated by red tape and overregulation. We have 380,000 and counting pieces of red tape that we're finding. Uh, BC has 200,000, and no one's told me that BC is a bad place to live in. So, Mr. Speaker, we have to work hard. Every cabinet minister, every member of our caucus is working hard to cut that red tape, not down the centre, but right across. Get out of the way of businesses and create jobs. Ontario is open for business. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Minister, those stories sound like they came from a horror movie. Ontario used to be the economic engine of Canada. People flocked to Ontario to pursue their dreams, build their lives for their families. The Liberals lost sight of the fact that the Treasury is the people of Ontario's money. Far too many provincial regulations are inflexible, they duplicate each other, they're out of date and misaligned with other jurisdictions. Our government for the people has begun to implement policy to restore accountability and open Ontario for business once again. Can the minister please update the legislature on Ontario's changing economic climate? That's a, minister. Uh, that's a, that's a great question from my a colleague, uh, I also want to shout out to uh, MPP and Parliamentary Assistant Michael Parsa. He's been doing these roundtables. They've been a huge success, and they've been, uh, and they've been providing us with great examples of, of red tape and uh, where we can cut and get out of the way of business so they can create jobs. It's all about putting food on the table for families, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're all about, and we can do that, and we will do that, and we are doing that. I don't want to be all doom and gloom. I want to congratulate Microsoft. They're creating 500 full-time positions and additional 500 positions for co-ops and interns. Uber is creating 300 jobs for technicians and engineers. Amazon's creating 1,500 construction jobs and permanently employing 600 people with its fulfillment center in Ottawa, and there's another one to come in uh, Ms. Jones' riding and, uh, in Caledon. And Instacart recently announced that they'll be hiring 200 employees. Congratulations to all these great job creators, to all these great employers. And Ontario is open for business. They're getting the message, and I hope soon we'll even be more open for business. Mr. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Kate Wettenham. Um, uh, speaker, this question is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, your ancestors and mine signed Treaty No. 9 in 1905, with uh, adhesion, uh, essentially additions made in 1929. The basis of that treaty is how together we manage and share the benefits from the land and then do so in a way that uh, is mutually beneficial. A recent court decision on the Ontario Divisional Court ruled that the Ministry of Northern Development and uh, mines fail to properly carry out the Crown's constitutional duty to consult uh, with the Abmatung uh, before uh, approving the land or gold exploration project. Um, 
Deputy Premier, do you intend to respect the court's decision and live up to the obligations under the treaty and properly consult the community as per court's decision? Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the uh, member opposite for that question. Uh, you know, Ontario is blessed with uh, incredible opportunities when it comes to our natural resources, and it's true uh, not only for us and, and Ontarians, but also our Indigenous communities who stand to benefit from economic development and mining, forestry, and natural resource development. And we are committed as a government to bringing good jobs back to this province in northern Ontario by developing our natural resources, to working with our strong local partnerships, our municipalities, our Indigenous communities to make Ontario open for business again. And we will duly consult with Indigenous uh, communities as well as northern Ontarians and rural municipalities going forward in our, as we develop our northern res resources. Sure. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, uh, back to the Deputy Premier. On July 9, uh, 2018, the Matawa chiefs sent a welcoming letter to the Premier asking to re-engage the vital regional negotiations necessary to, in order to set up the Ring of Fire. The Premier's office uh, wrote the chiefs to say that the Ministry uh, Minister of Indigenous Affairs would follow up. That was on August 9th, yet no meetings have been scheduled. The historic uh, regional framing agreement is for the Ring of Fire has stalled because the government hasn't engaged with the Matawa chief since this election. As noted, Mr. Speaker, uh, Yabmatung First Nation Chief Adlukin is here today. Uh, will the Premier direct the Minister of Indigenous Affairs not to get on the bulldozer, but to meet with, the, with Chief Adlukin today to Mr. begin a dialogue as affirmed by the courts so that future minds may someday go, move, go forward in a way that honors the treaty and that is mutually uh, beneficial to all parties. Thank you again for that uh, question, Member Opposite. It's through you to Speaker, or Speaker, through to you to the member. Um, you know, the Ring of Fire has great potential for the province of Ontario, and unfortunately, over the past 15 years, it's been stagnant, not only because of lack of consultations, but also the government opposite promised time and time again, but failed to follow through, which is the problem with Ontario in general. We need a province that's open for business. We need a province that's growing the resource uh, development throughout northern Ontario and our rural communities. That is what's going to make Ontario strong again. That's what's going to make Ontario open for business. The, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Minister of Energy, Minister of Northern Development, and minds, it takes his, his, his duty to consult very seriously, and he will continue to build those uh, relationships with Indigenous communities, municipalities, to build lasting partnerships. My ministry has been tasked with uh, developing resource sharing with uh, communities across Fonts. this province. We are working towards that. We are going to be partners in this communities with Indigenous communities, Everybody with wins. Northern Ontario, with rural communities. Everybody Ontario is open for business here, here. under the government of Doug Ford. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Durham. Speaker, my, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Yesterday, members on all sides of this House commemorated Rowan's Law Day, and I was happy to see so much purple in this place. Uh, even the Minister of Finance ditched his traditional uh, yellow tie to wear a purple one. I think that's worthy of a round of applause. <laughs> Our Rowan's Law Day isn't about clothing. It's about commemorating the life of Rowan Stringer, a 17-year-old Ottawa varsity rugby player who died from sustaining multiple concussions, resulting in a catastrophic brain injury. Rowan's Law was made to help keep people safe and ensure they know how to deal with concussions safely. Can the minister outline what our government's doing to ensure we educate people about concussions and how to properly deal with them. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you. Thank you to the member for Durham. I know you understand how important concussion awareness is. I cannot thank and acknowledge the work of Rowan's parents, Kathy and Gordon Stringer, for all their hard work on Rowan's Law. This is something they've been working on since their daughter was lost to a preventable death. I'd also like to extend my thanks to my friend and colleague, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. 
a member from Ottawa South, and the member from Water Waterloo for their work on making this bill a reality in the last parliament. Our government is committed and eager to implement the recommendations made by the Rowan's Law Advisory Committee. That includes implementing Rowan's Law Day and a multimedia campaign to ensure that children, athletes, coaches, educators and parents know what to do when they suspect a concussion. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm so glad that Rowan's legacy is being used to ensure that we can prevent more injury and in some cases, even death. I'm also encouraged that we're able to set aside our differences on all sides of the House to support this specific initiative and keep Ontarians safe on the playground, on the field, and on the ice. I've had a number of teammates whose uh, sporting ambitions were completely derailed by this type of injury. Everybody needs to be on board to ensure we're keeping athletes and kids safe. That includes parents, educators, and coaches. We all need to take these steps. Could the minister explain what these groups should do when it comes to concussions and the role they can play in treating and preventing concussions? Minister. I'd be pleased to. We all have a role to play in helping people keep, stay safe when it comes to concussions. As an athlete, if you suspect a concussion, ask your health care professional for a recovery plan that you can follow. You shouldn't be afraid to leave the game. Your safety is the most important thing. As a parent or guardian, ask your child's support, the sports club about their concussion prevention and management policies. Make sure they have a concussion protocol. As a coach, ask your organization about concussion training available to you. Knowing the first symptoms of a concussion can go a long way in preventing further damage. As an educator, you can ask your principal about your school's return to sport and return to learn concussion policies. Working together, we will make sure that our athletes are safe and supported. Thank you. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. This week, the Premier will make a final decision on the future of Ontario's overdose prevention sites. Technically, this decision will be based on the recommendation made by the Minister of Health. Speaker, will the Minister of Health tell the people of Ontario what was in her recommendation? Minister of Health. I thank the member very much for the question. We have been working on this issue quite diligently over the last two months. I have visited several uh, overdose prevention sites and supervised consumption sites. I have done a walk around. I have consulted with experts. I have neighbourhood people, uh, people with lived experience who have given me their thoughts. And I can tell you that I have shared this information with the Premier's office. We've been working very collaboratively on this issue, and we expect to be making an announcement very shortly. Supplementary. The Minister of Health. It's no secret that the Premier is firmly opposed to these sites staying open. He was clear about it during the campaign. The Minister herself said that even with her recommendation, and I quote, whatever I think is really not the point that matters. It's the Premier's decision, end quote. If the Premier unilaterally decides to shut down these sites, will the Minister finally stand up for the thousands of families affected by the opioid crisis and demand that the Premier continue to fund overdose prevention sites, or will she allow extensive evidence to be overridden by his uninformed personal views? Minister. As the member will know, the Premier has been very clear for many months that he wanted to make an evidence-based decision on whether these sites should remain open or should be closed down. That is the information that I have been collecting for these past several months that I have been sharing with the Premier's office. The Premier, it is true, makes the ultimate decision, but that doesn't mean that we don't work collaboratively on it. We have been doing that, and we will be making a, a, a decision. We will be making a recommendation. We are working with the Premier's office, and the Premier and I will be making an announcement very shortly on that. Thank you. Next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. In, rec in recognition of this being National Forest Week, it is important to appreciate the abundant amount of opportunities that are provided through our unique provincial forests. In fact, 66% of our province is made up of forested areas. 
Unfortunately, while the previ previous Liberal government was in power, the concerns of this industry were ignored. According to Statistics Canada, under that Liberal government, the forestry industry lost 51,000 jobs from 2003 to 2016. That's a 51 percent decrease over that span. During the election, our government ran on a promise to consult with residents about a multitude of issues. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please tell us how he will consult with Ontarians to attract investment and create jobs and foster those jobs in the forestry sector? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to uh, thank the uh, member from Sault Ste. Marie, who is a strong voice for Northern Ontario. This morning, I was pleased to announce my ministry's plan to engage with Ontarians as we work towards a provincial forestry strategy. Over the cover coming months, we're going to sit down with industry and municipal leaders to listen how we can tear down barriers and create an environment for growth. We're also looking forward to hearing from our Indigenous communities, who will also be an important part of the process. Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure the forestry sector is driven by a long-term vision for growth and sustainability, and that communities across the province share in the prosperity from this abundant renewable resource. The forestry industry generates over $15 billion in revenue and supports 150,000 direct and indirect jobs in 260 communities throughout this province. I look forward to continuing to grow the industry, and a provincial forestry strategy is an important first step in unleashing the potential for Ontario's forest here, industry. Here, here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister uh, for his answer, and I want to thank you for the great work you're doing to advance this very important cause on behalf of the people of uh, Ontario. Our government for the people promised that it would work hard to make Ontario the most prosperous region in North America to do business, and Ontario's forestry industry is a very important part of that. Forestry is vital to the social, economic, and environmental well-being of the communities across Ontario, <clears throat> Excuse me, and the hard-working people and families depend on the forestry sector. Mr. Speaker, I know that there's more we can do to grow this industry, to create more jobs and opportunities in northern Ontario and across the province, and to be more competitive and a stronger player in the global economy. I'm pleased to hear that our government will be listening to the people in regards to creating a provincial forestry strategy. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please explain how this strategy will ensure that the voices of the people of Ontario will be heard to ensure the future success of this vital industry? Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, for that question. And uh, as a member from Sault Ste. Marie stated, uh, over half of the forest jobs in Ontario were lost due to the Liberal neglect during their time of governing. That is why I'm pleased to announce to the House that starting next month, our government will be holding roundtables and gathering feedback online to help the province lay out a strategy for promoting economic growth within the forestry sector. The first roundtable session will be held in November in Sault Ste. Marie, followed by additional sessions in the new year in Kitchener, Kenora, Capus Casing, North Bay, Thunder Bay, Pembroke, Hearst, and Timmins. We are also inviting people to have their say about the forestry strategy by emailing us at forestrystrategy at ontario.ca. I look forward to hearing how our government can reduce barriers so that industry can create jobs and prosperity, not just in Northern Ontario, but across the province. Speaker, Ontario's wood and wood products are recognized around the world as, as the, the highest standard of forest management anywhere. Sustainable forest management helps Ontario's forests remain healthy and productive, grows our economy, and provides good here, jobs here. for Ontario. Ontario is open for business. Start the clock. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. In my community of London North Centre, Dr. Chris Mackey tells me over, the overdo temporary overdose prevention site has saved 35 lives and conducted 150 rehab referrals in as many days. This government committed to reviewing the evidence and providing an answer by the end of September. But the evidence was already clear. This approach saves lives. It's a well-researched and proven harm reduction tool for combating this unprecedented public health crisis. Does the Conservative Party honestly think this problem will go away if these sites are shut down? 
Will this government commit here and now to continuing to fund London's temporary overdose prevention site past the deadline of September 30th? Tell this House here and now. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the member very much for the question. I'm certainly well aware that there is a serious issue in many parts of Ontario with opioid overuse and overdoses. So it is something that we are taking very seriously here. The health and safety of every person of Ontario is obviously a concern. With respect to uh, overdose prevention sites and supervised consumption sites, I'm very pleased to say that Dr. Mackey was actually one of the people that presented to us on the work that he's doing in London and the activities he's undertaken and uh, the wraparound supports that he's also able to provide. This is something that we took very seriously into consideration. I'm very grateful that Dr. Mackey took the time to come from London to provide us with that evidence, and that is the kind of information that we need for the Premier to make an evidence-based decision about whether these sites should continue or not. And that is something that we will be announcing, we will, the, the Premier and I will be announcing very shortly, recognizing the September 30th deadline Spons? for responding and extending the timelines if they are to be extended. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to hear that this government is considering solid, robust, peer-reviewed evidence because these services save lives and they make a huge difference. Now, we're also been concerned over here in the official opposition because the 45-day pause on the on the overdose prevention sites has really reinforced this public health crisis. This crisis is bigger than HIV in the 90s and polio. In fact, if you took, put those two epidemics together and times them by two, you would get the same number of people dying each year in Canada from opioids. So, Speaker, in the face of a public health crisis and the overwhelming evidence that this treatment works, I trust that this government will do the right thing in continuing to fund temporary overdose prevention sites because it's the right thing to do. It's the humane thing to do. Minister. Well, thank you. The member is absolutely correct that there is a serious public health issue involved here. There are different ways that one can combat it. We have spoken with the Office of the Chief Coroner and the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario, as well as many other people, including people with lived experience who have told us quite directly what these sites have meant to them. We are taking all of that information into consideration in terms of making recommendations to the Premier, much of which has already been shared with the Premier, and as I said before, recognizing that this deadline is coming up in order to achieve the extension, if that is to be done, has to be done before September 30th, and therefore an announcement will be made very shortly. Next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, a few days ago we heard the deeply disturbing and shocking news that Terry Lynn McClintock, who was convicted of the kidnapping, murder, and rape of young eight-year-old Tori Stafford was to be transitioned into a healing lodge. I'm aware that our Minister of Agriculture, Rural Affairs wrote to the letter of the Minister of Public. We always know that the federal Liberals put the interests of criminals above those of victims, so I would advise you to just listen. In fact, we knew that the Minister of Agriculture spoke to the father, and our Premier spoke to the father as well, Mr. Speaker and has made it clear that we will do everything to ensure that justice is served as originally attended for Mrs. McClintock. Question. Mr. Speaker, can the minister give this place an update on what he is doing to urge the government to take immediate action to reverse this shameful decision? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for this question. I want to begin by reiterating that my thoughts and the thoughts of our government remain with the family of Tory Stafford. We're shocked, Mr. Speaker, and saddened that such a change in direction was taken by the federal government, bringing back feelings of anger and despair for all of those affected. As I mentioned before in the legislature, decisions like this made by our federal government can seriously impact the public's confidence in our correctional systems. I'll be writing a letter myself to the Federal Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Mr. Ralph Goodale, to get clarification on how such a decision could possibly have been made and what can be done to revert it, reverse it. 
Our government has remained committed to improving our community safety and correctional services. This includes working with our federal counterparts to do the same and to ensure that Spons. justice is served as intended. Canada can do better, and our government here in Ontario will encourage the federal government to do so as well. We must do better. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister. Minister, thank you for that answer, and thank you for your swift action on this. Thank you as well to the Premier for his swift, swift action as well. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that has stood on principle on this issue, that has made it clear in this place, on record, that we will not stand by as this shameful decision by our federal government has been made. Mr. Speaker, in fact, we've also heard the attitude of the Federal Minister of Public Safety and his initial remarks on this, who described the crimes committed by Terry Lynn McClintock as bad practices. Mr. Speaker, can the minister reassure this legislature that this matter is being taken with the seriousness it deserves, and can he give us an update on what he and our government's going to do to ensure that we put the rights of victims before those of criminals? Okay. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I refer this to the Minister of Agriculture. Of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And, and thank the member for the question. And I thank the Minister of Community and Safety, Community Safety and Correctional Services for treating this matter with utmost importance. Upon hearing about the sudden and disturbing news and the change of direction taken by the federal government regarding this matter, we reached out to the Staff Stafford family. The family expressed that they are grateful to finally have a government that cares, takes action, and works for the people. Our government stands behind the Stafford family, and I am encouraged to see that the community of Woodstock is taking action to call on the federal government to change its decision. The residents in my riding are watching this matter very closely, and we're all hoping to see quick action taken so that justice can be delivered and closure can be brought to the family of Tory Stafford. Together with the Premier, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, we are taking real action to see what can be done to correct this poor and unfortunate decision. And Mr. Speaker, earlier it was mentioned that yesterday we were all wearing um, purple for Romans Law, and I just want to say I'm still wearing it today. It was Tory Stafford's favourite colour. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Transit experts and the head of the TTC have said that breaking up Toronto's transit to upload the subway to the province is a disaster in waiting. The people of Toronto deserve to know what's happening with their transit system. Can the Premier share the details of this government's plan to upload the TTC? Premier. <laughs> for you, Mr. Speaker. During the election, we made it very, very clear we need a regional transportation system to get people from point A to point B in a rapid fashion. Our number one priority is going to build that downtown relief line. We're going to make sure there's a three-stop subway in Scarborough. And over the years, over the years, we haven't been able to build transit in this city. We have not been able to build transit. We're going to build a regional transportation system, a great subway system, one of the best in the world, but we're going to start getting the shovels in the ground. Years ago, Mr. Speaker, when the province downloaded the transit, there was an outcry when they downloaded the transit. Now we're going to support the TTC. We're going to make sure we keep the workers there. We're going to make sure we support the frontline workers, and we'll build the best regional transportation system in the world. Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound has a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to remind everyone of the Childhood Cancer Awareness Month photo that will take place in the Grand Stairway at 11:50 to honor all those children fighting this terrible disease. Thank you. Point of order, the member for Guelph. That uh, Dr. Karen Mark is in the members' gallery. I would like to welcome her to Queens Park and thank her for the great work you've done with J Space and other organizations. 
Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Premier concerning denouncing Faith Goldie. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. It is my pleasure to introduce a former member of provincial parliament who served in this house for many years and, I might add, always demonstrated respect for parliament in the way he behaved. The member for York Mackenzie, in the 36th Parliament, the member for Oak Ridges, 37th and 38th Parliament, and the member for Newmarket Aurora, 39th and 40th Parliament, Mr. Frank Cleese. Welcome to the Legislature. <laughs> there being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.